I was late because I was at another function. I was trying to decide, do I go to that function or do I be late for this one? And I looked at the agenda and I, I whizzed through and I was like, oh, something about, something about art, something about sustainability. And I was like, oh, I, I work in sustainability. That, that's good. And I was like, I, I think I can miss the, the, the beginning one on art. And then I, I walked in halfway through and, and, uh, and uh, looking at all these beautiful pictures and hearing about all this beautiful art, and particularly from, from the Muslim world where I travel quite a bit, and Iran where I've, where I've traveled as well. And I was like, this is why Piero brings together art and science, because you, you come and you find things that you don't always see and you don't always work on. So I really regret uh, missing half the talk, and it's really good. So thank you for bringing these two worlds together. Um, so I want to start by uh, talking about what synthetic biology is and what SynBioBeta is. I work 50% of my time at NASA. I'm director of planetary sustainability there, and we work on technology partnerships that make uh, it cheaper and easier to be sustainable in space. And then we bring those technologies back to Earth and try and solve some of those sustainability problems that we have here around food, water, waste, and air. Um, and the other 50% of my time, I run SynBioBeta, and I do consulting with a number of startup companies. So it's an organization for synthetic biology startup companies, and I run events that bring together investors with startup companies, and uh, we teach courses in synthetic biology, and we have a blog and a news digest. Um, so I want to start by asking um, how many people here could tell me how a gene relates <coughs> to a protein? And you can just stick your hand up if, if you could. And, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to do it. <laughs> if you stick your hand up, it's just going to help me to know how, how, how much detail to go into. So that's uh, about 40% of people could say that they understand how a gene relates to, to a protein. Um, so um, I'll just give a quick primer to, to, to in biology, and the majority of this is for the other 60% of people. Um, so cells are self-replicating machines. Inside of cells is DNA. The DNA makes proteins. Cells can replicate every 20 minutes. And uh, one of my heroes, John von Neumann, the father of computer science, uh, talked about self-replicating machines. Little did he know that we have actually self-replicating machines because the structure of DNA and the sequence of DNA was isolated. We have biological machines in every single one of your cells and in every single one of these cyanobacteria or algae or uh, or bacteria. Um, and biology is a manufacturing technology. In uh, each cell you have multiple <coughs> copies uh, of uh, DNA and the DNA encodes for proteins these other functional molecules which actually do the things. They cut things, they form structures, they are colors that change uh, with different wavelengths of light. Um, so the proteins are the things that actually do the things and the DNA is the stuff that stores the message. Um, the cell is the chassis for the genome. The genome is the operating system for the cell. And I'm going to um, show you a quick video. What you are about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. How a simple code is turned into flesh and blood. It begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. This is an animation. A gene is simply a length of DNA instruction stretching away to the left. But it's in real time. The assembled factors trigger the first phase of the process, reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. Everything is ready to roll. Three, two, one, go. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to copy the A's, C's, 
T's and G's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related building block known as U. You are watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. Um, 50 years ago, we didn't even know the structure of DNA. 10 years ago, uh, we didn't know the sequence of the human genome. Um, this technology, as I'm going to show you in a couple of charts, is increasing exponentially, both in our ability to read DNA, that is, you could go and sequence your whole genome for, uh, I'm pretty sure you could do it for $1,000 these days. It was always the dream that we could do that. I'm pretty sure that we can do it for $1,000. Um, but uh, did you know we're going through a revolution in writing DNA as well? You could actually write out a complete chromosome, not of a human yet, but of a bacterial uh, genome. And that was demonstrated by Craig Venter and his group um, about two or three years ago now. So synthetic biology um, is a bit like uh, the web and web 2.0, that uh, you saw a lot more finesse done when web 2.0 came along. Things seemed to be connected, a bit more logically connected together, and <coughs> things seemed to work a bit better and look a bit more beautiful. And it, got a lot of people excited and a lot more money into the field. Um, and a bunch of people said, what is Web 2.0? It's nothing different. We've been doing it uh, all along. So you've got that similar thing with synthetic biology now. A lot of new blood into the field, a lot of new money from investors investing in the field, uh, smarter ways of doing things, better ways, easier ways to engineer biology. And you've got the old guard saying, this is nothing new. We've been doing this for, for 30 years. Um, but at the core of synthetic biology is the process of trying to make biology uh, easier to engineer and trying to turn biology into an engineering discipline. Um, just as computer science, if you look at the history of it and you go back and you trace back computer science departments at universities, they invariably either came out of uh, physics and mathematics or they came out of electrical engineering. And if you trace back, you'll find the types of research being done now is um, a product of the history of where that department was, was spawned from. And it's the same with biology now. If you go to a genetic engineering department or a synthetic biology department or computational biology department, you will get strands of those departments that are very much <coughs> science oriented and strands of those departments that are very much engineering oriented. Uh, I'm more on the engineering side. I want to make things and I want to make it easier to engineer or Symbiobate is the company that I started. We had our first meeting in Menlo Park in 2012. Uh, we brought together a bunch of startup companies that nobody really knew existed yet. It's a new industry and uh, people wouldn't have thought there were enough companies to have a conference dedicated to synthetic biology companies. Uh, but we did and it was very popular. Uh, we had uh, a lot of these companies represented there. And we had another one just last, uh, just last November in Mission Bay, and we're running another one in London in April. So, so it's a, a hot field, a lot of investors in this field, and a lot of new companies. I'm going to talk about the types of companies that there are in synthetic biology, and show just on this chart here how fast they're growing. There's an exponential increase in the number of synthetic biology companies. Um, and you see them generally in these four <coughs> different areas. This is worldwide, in the United States, California. This is worldwide, but the majority are in the Bay Area. Um, and if you look at the um, total US bioeconomy now, um, and you look at just the amount of genetically modified stuff in the US bioeconomy, it accounts for more than 2% of gross domestic <coughs> product. So um, like, it, like it or not, in terms of genetic modification, it's, it's a contributing a significant amount to the economy. Um, in terms of crops, drugs, and, uh, and chemical production. So I'm going to start with the bottom rung of this Symbio stack, which is gene and genome synthesis. This is a bit like um, this is a bit like the zeros and ones of a of a uh, circuit board, but instead the A's, C's, T's, and G's. You could type out a series of A's, C's, T's, and G's on your computer, email them to a company, maybe a hundred. 
uh, or, or 200 letters and um, the next morning via FedEx you could have you could have that DNA that's being printed out uh, and holding it in your hand ready to do your experiment so there are a lot of companies in this in this uh, field of gene and genome synthesis that is making DNA it's the substrate for genetic engineering um, these are oligos is the name for small pieces of DNA and there are different ways to assemble them and to, to make them. Uh, the market size is about $230 million um, worldwide. Um, and it's pretty much an old technology. The, the chemistry is 30 years old. It hasn't changed that much. Um, I showed a picture of Rob Carson a second ago. And these are uh, this was coined by The Economist. They are Carson's curve. Um, just like you've got Moore's law, the number of resist, uh, transistors on a computer chip doubling every 18 months. This is Carson's curve, which shows that the cost of sequencing uh, is halving every 18 months. And also the cost of synthesis, that is writing A's, C's, T's, and G's, is also halving every 18 months. So you've got these kind of exponentials that are driving the field and making investors very excited about what the future holds. And here are just some of the companies. Um, DNA 2.0 is down in Menlo Park. Uh, SGI DNA is in San Diego. GenScript is in, mostly in China. Uh, Genable is in the UK. So next up on the rung is CAD tools for genome engineering. If you can, uh, if you can write millions of bases of A's, C's, T's, and G's, what are you going to <coughs> say with it? Well, at the moment, we're we're kind of at the equivalent of um, the first word processor in terms of writing genetic code. So we were maybe using a basic uh, script, uh, and now we're at the word processor. Uh, we're about to, there are some drag and drop interfaces for doing genetic design as well um, that people have come up with. Um, so here are a number of companies that are working in the area of computer-aided design tools for gene and genome design. Next up, we have organism engineering platforms. And uh, Craig Venter, who I mentioned earlier, is one of the leaders in this field. Uh, his company, Synthetic Genomics, has a platform for doing uh, digital to biological conversion. That is, taking a sequence of A, C, C's, and G's and synthesizing a whole organism from, or the genome for a whole organism from that. Um, and there are a number of other companies that have good platform technologies in this area. If you then look at the top and think about the applications, a lot of these are biofuel applications, that is conversion of carbon or some other um, CO2 or some other carbon product into a higher value fuel or a higher value chemical. Um, and what you've seen is that a lot of these companies started from the um, green subsidies that were made available to try and shift us from a petrochemical fuel economy to a bio-based fuel economy. Once the subsidies ran out, the, a lot of these companies have shifted their infrastructure towards high specialty chemicals that you can sell for a lot more than you can fuel. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of making fuel cheap enough um, to uh, billions of dollars uh, buy them again.